That's Matthew chapter 6, and we'll begin our reading from verse 19 to 34, and that's page 978 on the Church Bibles. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, a number of years ago, I went to the opticians with a minor irritation of the eye, and it transpired there was a small object that appeared to have penetrated the outer eyeball. Thankfully, Moorfields Eye Hospital is just up the road, and after close investigation and probing with a microscopic pair of tweezers, and I'm glad to say very steady hands, a small piece of rusted metal was removed. How did it get there? Well, <laughs> it had to do with a chainsaw, a very old piece of wood, a rusty nail, and a lack of goggles. And it was a narrow escape. And last week, we spent our Sunday morning with the finest financial advisor the world has ever known. His services remain available today. If you want them, they're free. No stock he's ever picked has ever failed. There's no small print. The graph always goes up, never down. His fund only increases in value and invest with him. Our savings will be safe. Our riches will not rot. This morning, we're off to the opticians. And we're dealing with the issue of eyesight. And if you like a kind of short, sharp sentence at the start of a talk like this to help us know where we're going, it's this. Beware, goggles should be worn. And if that's not quite enough for you and you want a bit of what you might call a strap line, I think they call it, possessions can seriously damage our vision. Now, in this brief uh, three-week series, we're considering just six verses. Three verses last week, two this, and one next. After 10 weeks in 31 chapters of 1 Samuel, I thought we might slow down just a touch. And having spoken so much about the Church of England and issues of sexuality, I thought it would be good for us to spend three weeks on a slightly different area. And these six verses are bracketed with explicit mention of treasure or of mammon, money. You can see in verse 19, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, and then at the end of verse 24, you cannot serve God and money. The word is mammon, mammon, uh, that in which we trust. We'll come to it 
next week. Even as we see, no one can serve two masters. I know you're thinking to yourself, I think I can. Well, we'll deal with that next week. So it's possessions that we're thinking about, and these six verses form part of four different aspects that are prone to rot up our relationship with God. So, verse 19, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Verse 25, do not be anxious. Chapter 7, verse 1, judge not. And then verse 6, do not give dogs what is holy. And here's our point. Beware, possessions can seriously damage our eyesight. When handling stuff, goggles should be worn. First, the undivided eye and the unclouded life. Now, if we're going to get hold of what Jesus is teaching at this point in the Sermon on the Mount, we need to understand Jesus is using the language of eyesight, light and darkness, as picture language for the health of our relationship with God. So it's our spiritual life and our acceptance of and usefulness in and enjoyment of the kingdom of God that is the issue. So the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. In a sense, what Jesus says here can be just taken in the flat, quite literally. Almost everything in our physical life is impacted by our eyesight. I know that a number of us here suffer from impaired vision, and it must make us long for the day when we're given a new body in the new creation. And I know those of us who in one way or another suffer from one form or another of visual impairment, you know, they develop any number of coping mechanisms. And yes, in a world where visual aids and societal accept visual aid, sorry, and societal acceptance of visual difficulty is vastly improved, there are multiple things that somebody who has impaired eyesight can participate in, and indeed numerous ways in which their other senses are developed. And we're going to see, in some ways, they may be able to see far better than we can. Nonetheless, damaged eyesight, poor in eyesight, it does impact everything. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. And much, much more so in Jesus' day without the developments and benefits that we have. Writing, reading, reading another's body language, spotting somebody across the room, enjoying the view the job market. And then today, where so much of our culture is visual, seeing the screen, any form of navigation pretty much, driving. And in that sense, it is through the eye that the whole body becomes full of light. The eye brings light into the body in that sense. So when Jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body, he means that it's through the eye that the light streams in. And again, back in Jesus' day, you know, in a very, very hot climate, thick walls, no windows, no, eye, no air conditioning, and tiny slits to preserve the cool of the day, it was the lamp that lit up the room. You might say it was what is for us today the window. In fact, I think you could read the verse quite easily like that. A number of people have said they find it quite hard to make sense of this verse. Well, how about trying it like, like this? The eye is the window of the body. And so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. So understood spiritually, what we look at, how we see, what we gaze on, this will impact our whole life. He's speaking spiritually. He's using picture language. Of course, it's true, literally, but he's speaking spiritually. And so our relationship with God, our enjoyment of his kingdom, our usefulness to him, all of our life impacted spiritually by the health of our spiritual eyes, you might say. And that point is made all the more clear when we consider the little word healthy. Do you see it says there, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light? It actually could equally be translated undivided. It's a negative. If your eye is undivided, it comes from a word whose root can mean to fold. So if your eye is single, if it's not folded, if it's not double, it could mean generous if your eye is generous, but single is more likely. 
And so slightly tweaking it, we might say if your eye is focused, if your eye is undistracted, if you see things spiritually and you're not dragged off in every five, six, seven directions, if your spiritual eye is unfolded. And in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is asking, where is our focus? And in the context of these verses, Jesus is saying, oh, do not store up treasure for yourself on the earth. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be. And of course, as we store up our own treasure vault on the earth, you remember verse 21 last week, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Not the other way around, where your passion is, there your treasure will be. No, Jesus knows us much better than our favorite preacher. He says he's much more practical. What you actually do, what we, how we handle our concrete treasure, that's actually going to lead our passion. And so make sure your eye is single, not divided. When it comes to possessions, they could seriously damage our eyes. Goggles should be worn. Is it time we went to the optician? If so, would our optician recommend a trip to Moorfields? Or is there a spiritual equivalent of fitness first for our eyes that we might go to? Excuse me, madam, you appear to be getting a little cross-eyed. Double vision seems to be an issue. Before you consider laser surgery, might I suggest the odd eye exercise? So with that in place, and hopefully some understanding of these first of these two verses, uh, we can now begin to plug the two verses back into the structure of the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. And you can see the little box that I've had drawn for you on your handout under point one there. And there we have the structure of the Sermon on the Mount laid out for us. So the Sermon on the Mount begins with the Beatitudes. That's the beautiful life. And the Sermon on the Mount goes on then to give moral teaching, then spiritual teaching, then relational teaching, and then it finishes with two ways to live. Some hard choices need to be made. It's intensely practical. But right at the very core of the spiritual teaching is the Lord's Prayer. And so at the heart of the kingdom of God is this relationship with the Father, and to that extent, we store up treasure in heaven today as we fix our eyes on our Father in heaven and develop that relationship. The emphasis, of course, is on the future. We'll enjoy it then, but we also enjoy it today. Life lived with the Father, he's the one in heaven, as we store up our treasure in relationship with him, why the whole of life becomes the beautiful life. And so says Jesus, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who is in secret will reward you. Undistracted devotion, the private place, not seeking the audience of the world, but seeking an audience with the father, our father in heaven. He knows, he cares, he loves, he sees. He longs for this intimate moment and the life lived well as we live undistracted for our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. And where his name is honored and hallowed, that is the chief good of all of humanity, where his name is honored and hallowed, the whole of heaven and all of creation praises God. Hallowed be your name. Here is the life lived well, our Father in heaven. Hallowed, your kingdom come. We've seen the beauty and the integrity and the value and the worth and the courage and the goodness of Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus, Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come in my family, so that my children live with you as king, in my own life, in the workplace, we have an undivided gaze. That's our longing and our chief desire. Your will be done. We've got this decision, Lord, in our family. We don't know which way to turn. Help us to walk in your will on earth as it is in heaven. So you see, storing up treasure is... 
Well, it is in very many ways a this world exercise. Of course, it's going to be enjoyed in the next world, as we saw in our 1 Timothy uh, reading. But it's our Father who is in heaven, and it's the relationship with him that is the treasure, if you like. And we develop that and enjoy it today in the private place. But, oh dear, possessions can be such a distraction. The desire for wealth can give us double vision. And the New Testament is packed with examples of individuals with 20-20 vision. What about Timothy? I have nobody like him who looks not to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. What a fine guy, undivided. Epaphroditus, who dropped everything and traveled across the Mediterranean, had no idea what his job was, but he put it all on hold, his career and everything. He put it on hold to deliver money to the Apostle Paul so that he could continue with his gospel preaching in prison. The Philippian church, who supported Paul from the get-go. Prisca and Aquila, who appeared to make room in their business to employ the apostle Paul so that he could engage in the business of Christian proclamation. Undivided eyes. And then there are examples of the opposite. Demas, one of the most chilling verses in the whole of the New Testament. Demas in love with this present world has deserted me. Well, I could list any number of examples of undivided eyes. I think of one individual, a trader, used to come here on a Tuesday lunchtime and try and bring his entire team. And the markets were all buzzing, but he would say at 10 to 1, uh, we're all leaving and we're heading off. We'll only make more money or less if we leave our desks. Let's go and hear good news about Jesus. Other business people who've decided, actually, they're going to be undistracted. They seem to get given a bonus. I know people get given bonuses. They pay them far more than they're worth here in the city. And uh, a bonus comes along, and they determine to give the whole thing to Christian work. Undivided eyes. Some city workers giving 30 40%, 50% of their salary. Undivided eyes. And then this beautiful incident... I remember many, many years ago now, but when we were doing up St. Andrew's Church and uh, I arrived in on a Sunday morning and there in my pigeonhole, I don't know how it got there because normally I'm not allowed to handle money at all, keep it all well away from, uh, and there in the, it was an envelope and in the envelope, a crumpled five pound note. We just thought this might be helpful for the building. So if our eye is focused, then our whole life will be full of light, generous, healthy. I want to invest my whole life well. I want to make right decisions. I want to get to the end of my life and look back on a life not wasted. I want to store up treasure in the only place where it will last. And I want to receive that great acclamation at the end, well done, good and faithful servant. So the I is absolutely key. We're talking spiritually, our relationship with the Father. Our family are great friends with David and Maxine Cook. Many of us will know David and Maxine. He's a well-known preacher, preaches around the world, and he's often visited, and when he visits, he usually stays with us. And David has got uh, a very poor track record, if I may say. I'm just hoping he's not going to listen to this, or some of our Australian friends aren't going to tell him about this. But he's got a very poor track record in our family of film recommendations. Okay, so you know how it is when you're, one person's taste is not another's. And he's often recommended us films, and to be honest, they've been pretty hard to endure, particularly the one which he'd seen on the aeroplane, which had had all the bits that we shouldn't hear cut out. And so when we watched it with a nine-year-old, it was really most interesting. <laughs> but we got this week a recommendation for a film, Living. We watched it last night. It's about a guy at the close of his working life who's given the diagnosis of a terminal illness. He's just got a short period left to work, nine months. Faced with this diagnosis, he begins plunging himself into worldliness. He sees the stupidity of it. And then he uses what remains of those nine months, in a sense, to immortalize himself through what he does. It's got a great title, Living. Now, what he does is not governed by the Sermon on the Mount, I may say, and therefore you would want to invest in something slightly different. But, you know, if you really want to live 
to live. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. A relationship with the Father. That's living. And you can have the worst eyesight in the world and see better than anybody else and use your life gloriously, it seems. So in one sense, you say we say we're talking about treasure, we're talking about possessions, we're talking about riches. We're not talking about that at all, really. Jesus is talking about the relationship with the Father. And it's quite right then to talk about a discipleship review or a discipleship MOT. You know, how is that relationship? And then characteristically Jesus turns it on its head and does the whole exercise negatively. So have a look at verse 23. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So the damaged eye and the life of darkness. Okay, so the word here for bad is evil. This confirms that we're right to be understanding this spiritually. And we must make sure that we plug this second sentence on eyesight to within the paragraph in which it's placed. Laying up treasure for ourselves on earth can seriously damage our eyesight. Laying up treasure on earth can plunge us into darkness. How great will be that darkness as we set our eyes on possessions? When it comes to possessions, goggles should be worn. Okay, we could rip it out of its context and just talk about the undivided eye more generally. You know, that relationship, I've got a desire for intimacy and I'm absolutely adamant that it's going to be found in this relationship. The Bible says about, a lot about relationships and this relationship, but it's not quite what the Bible encourages, but I'm absolutely adamant about it. Well, that could divide your eye. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. I mean, it could be a passion, couldn't it? Like something as simple as bird watching. Or train spotting, can you imagine? Or, or, or the country life? Or the beautiful home? Or DIY? Or, or golf or gardening? Or the theater or film watching? Or it could be my social life. I want to be in with the crowd. I don't want to be, I'm, I'm, I'm frightened of missing out. I, I want to be considered one of the lads or one of the girls, whatever it happens to be. That's not actually the matter in hand. The subject is possessions. <laughs> Jesus says, do not treasure up for yourself. Treasures on the earth. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Your treasure, that which we really value, it will tether our desires. Because we think about it, don't we? We mull it over. Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Is my collection growing? Is it mm, am my treasure? And if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of light. So it is treasure that we have to consider, and our treasure can plunge us into darkness. Our obsession with the retirement pot, it could put our lights out. Our desire to have this, that, or the other can lead us into the shadow lands. One friend of mine describes the obsession, hours online looking for the best deal, as retail pornography. It's quite a good description. I did a little research with the National Eye Institute. What are the kind of things I could get wrong with my eyes? Well, there's retinopathy. I I have no idea what that is. A medic can come and tell me afterwards. There's there's glaucoma. There's there's retinal detachment. That sounds horrible. There's an astigmata, an astigma. And that's before you get to cataracts or lazy eyes or floaters or short or long sight. But, you know, on their website, there's not a single thing about possessions. And so, you know, if you have the ability and the skill, could I ask you to do something? Hack in, please, to the National Eye Institute, if if that's not too much against the law. I'm not sure if you're allowed to do that. And when you get to lazy eyes, short or long sighted, in huge capital letters, will you print possessions? They can ruin your eyesight. Treasure. And we don't have to be wealthy to have a problem with possessions. It's just as much an obsession for the poor as it is for the rich. 
and the have-nots can be equally blinded by envy as the haves by greed, and laying up treasure on earth can plunge us into darkness. Uh, The one Timothy reading, it talks about treasure being a snare, a shipwreck, piercing our soul. It speaks of being wealthy, having a great danger of pride or utter delusion. You think it's going to last? Really? Beware. Goggles should be worn. So I've just come from the 10 o'clock. I was speaking on this in the 10 o'clock. They always have a children's slot at the 10 o'clock. And so I thought, well, with great apologies to anybody who's ever, ever done a children's slot, here is my best effort. Okay, goggles, here they are. This is what should be worn. Okay, so you're going shopping on on Amazon. Make sure you've got your goggles on. Uh, uh, You think you're going to get a pay rise this month? Put on your goggles, please. Uh, You think you might get a bonus? Goggles should be worn. Uh, You're going to get an inheritance. Don't forget the goggles. Remember what we said last week. The Bible doesn't put spiritual value on making oneself penniless. Having stuff is not of the devil. Some individuals entrusted with possessions can do a huge amount of good. Nor does the Bible forbid forbid saving for a rainy day. Quite the opposite. Think of the ant or the person who does not care for their family being worse than the unbeliever. Nor does the Bible tell us that we're to sell up and impoverish our family and go and farm chia seeds and live off nettle soup in North Wales. I'm sorry, if you come from North Wales, it's just where they all seem to go. But it's the divided eye. It's time to wrap up. For our culture, whose first commandment has become the precise reverse of the tenth, this could not be more challenging. The tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet. The first commandment for the Western world I must have. When God has been cancelled, I must have rules. It has to. In a material world, if we cut out God the master, well, the only master ultimately that will govern is I must have. Of course, if all I can see is all there is, there is then no greater goal than I must have. And so when God has been cancelled, I must have becomes the first commandment. I must have that new iPhone. You got your goggles? Do you know, I really can't survive without that new oven or that new kitchen. Uh, we must have that second or third holiday. We, we must have it, you know. I, I, I must make sure that my pension pot is this amount. Uh, my savings must have reached And Jesus seems to suggest that I must have will prevent me from making profitable decisions. And so the question comes, is it time for us to go to the optician, the undivided eye, and the unclouded life, the damaged eye, and utter darkness? So this week, the optician. Last week, the financial advisor. Next week, the job center. Let's pray together. Our dear Father in heaven, we praise you for the privilege of knowing you as our Father. And we thank you for the life truly lived as we seek first your kingdom. And every one of us, Father, we pray for us all that you would clear our eyes and show us what really matters and cause us to set our eyes on things above and to pursue walking closely with you, our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.